Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 140 for Wednesday, November 15th, 2017. Greetings, folks, and Welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here at GigGabPodcast.com. And here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. thought you were going to say Gig, Gig Gab headquarters in Durham, New Hampshire. Oh, I don't know where the headquarters are. It's uh, it's, in, it's in our hearts and in our minds. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. And how are you today, Mr. Kent? I'm doing really good. I'm, uh, I'm into a, a good time of year. Like a lot of my day job stuff is kind of tailing down a little bit and I get to kind of enjoy November and December. I've got a few music things, not an overwhelming number of them, but certainly a good number. And, uh, and it's just kind of fun. Remember how we were talking about when you can just kind of like enjoy getting to a gig instead of having to rush to a gig at the yes. end of a long day. It's a very different thing. It is a very different thing. Yeah, for sure. I'm always, uh, uh, a little bit envious of, of, folks like you and I say like you, but it's only like you now that get to wind down during November and December um, in our business being consumer focused. We are very much wound up during November and December. So, uh, and I know you used to live that world too. When you had Macworld Expo to do in January, that was, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was right. The, the holidays were like crazy, including, including the Christmas holiday and yeah. that week between Christmas and New Year's where the rest of the world kind of shuts down. Yeah. That was a, that was a brutal week for us, it's but uh, brutal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it is what it is. It is what it is. That's right. Um, so we have, uh, we have a question from Kevin that came in that I wanted to go through. He said, uh, Dave fling fest. I want to organize a similar event in my area. Can you provide a cliff notes version of what you guys do? I've tried to piece it together from listening to the shows. It sounds like you slash fling host a family friendly show and have a couple of other acts, youth bands, perhaps on the bill. It also appears that this is done as a fundraiser. Other than that, I am not sure what you do. Do you do this with food and drink adult beverages? Any other details would be great. Yeah. So this was um, the, the, the genesis for Fling Fest started when we used to do these gigs for the middle school jazz band here would have an, an auction every other year to raise money for their their uh, biennial. I think I've got that word right. Trip to Disney World. And we did it a few times. We would play and the the auction would be generally just for parents of the kids in the band and anybody else that wanted to come. And so they would uh, arrange to have the kids taken off somewhere else during this auction where there was, you know, like booze served and, and silent auction and a, a live auction. And then the band would play as kind of the, you know, the cap on the evening. And it happened that every time we did this, I think we did it at least twice, maybe three times. Uh, every time we did it, the kids would come back sort of before the set ended and there would be this magical moment where kids and parents were just like up and dancing and hanging out together and having a blast. And we thought, well, why do we have to wait every two years for something like this to happen? Like this could happen all the time. And and that was sort of the idea behind Fling Fest. So we started pitching this to bars. And of course, bars were like, no, uh, it's crazy. And we said, no, 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 we like, it'll be great. And, and they said, well, you know, and we'd, we'd say, look, we want to do it seven to 10. They're like, oh, no, no, the gig has to start at 10. Nobody wants live music at seven o'clock. And, and of course, like I've said on this show, uh, we disagreed. So the, but our thought process behind it was kind of like a, a summer barbecue sort of thing. And I use barbecue in the new England sense, really just a summer cookout sort of thing. Uh, Happening indoors, not in the summer, fall, you know, winter, spring kind of thing. And uh, and so the first one we wound up doing at uh, a place in uh, north of me here called the Rochester Opera House, which is an opera house. And they have all kinds of uh, events there and, and all sorts of things. And, and we got it for a night and it worked great. We had like, I don't know, 300 people in the first. And, uh, and it worked out really well. We did our seven to 10, but people kept asking me the same thing. Like, what do you do about like adult beverages? And the answer to that question was always, well, 
if you came over to my house for a cookout and I offered you a beer, but you had your kids with you, what would you answer? It's like, I'd have a beer. Great. Perfect. Then you can do the same thing at the Rochester Opera House. Just because we have a roof over our heads doesn't change any of that. Just don't drink so much that you can't drive your kids home. Uh, and, and that's basically where it came from. The first one we had to do as a fundraiser for the Rochester Opera House because that was the way we got the room for free. And it is a, a nonprofit kind of thing. It's part of the town and all that. So that sort, of, that sort of paved that way. And we've done most of them as fundraisers, mainly to help get the word out and do good uh, for our community. I think there was one where we, uh, one or two maybe, where we didn't do it as a fundraiser, but gave most of the money to the kids' bands. And they were you know pretty stoked to get uh, a paying gig and all that stuff. So uh, so that that's that's kind of the vibe behind it. And that... To me, that's the way to pitch it to clubs too. You've got to, you've got to go in with that kind of knowing that this is a different thing and not every club's going to buy into it. We finally found one that really sort of, you know, grokked the family concept. So that's what we do. Did I, did I cover that? I know you're not Kevin Paul, but yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Uh Oh, you started to chime in. Paul. Uh oh. Well, I'm going to pause this until I can find Paul. All right, I found him. So, yeah, it's all I was asking you. I know you're not Kevin, but but uh, in listening to this as a sounding board, did I did I cover it? Did I, is there anything I missed? No, no, no. I, I think you did a great job of explaining the vibe and the intent, which I think, you know, that's the first step to this is why do you want to do that? Right. And what does, you know, you have to have a very, like anything in life, you have to have kind of a clear mission and then you make a bunch of decisions based off on that mission. And while, while you were talking about that, I was thinking about um, that concept of a venue for, for, for this type of gig, you know, a bar, a club is its own type of environment, right? Yes. And I would imagine for a lot of kids under 18, walking into a bar is going to be a very weird, and it might not be right. You know, again, I don't, I don't know what the chapel is like for you, but, um, but you know, like you think of most bars, again, they have the benefit of built-in stages, often right. built-in sound systems. You know, that's, that helps that they have the physical facilities that you need, but is it the right environment? And It, ha- you know, it has I- to be the right kind of bar. It really needs to be a bar slash restaurant or it, it and, and that's really what I would call the stone church. Uh, but, but in seeking out a place, perhaps looking for a restaurant with a stage might be a better way to kind of do that. But you're totally right. I mean, we, you know, not every bar, in fact, I would say most bars wouldn't fit for this, but the stone church happens too. Um, but I think it's smart. I think it's smart for, um, musicians slash entrepreneurs who want to get into doing these types of things to kind of evaluate all types of things. Are there event spaces? Like, you know, there are, around here places in the East coast, there are these, you know, kind of beautiful kind of like wedding, um, venues, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, like beautiful homes that are turned into venues, right? We don't have that in California so much, but there are like corporate event spaces. There sure are lots of wineries, you know, there's different types of ways. And remember, you know, a stage, you can rent a stage and bring in, it brings your costs up, but you can rent a stage and you can bring it in lights. You can rent a stage and bring in, but I often feel like it's uh, it's frustrating because we have clubs around here and clubs are like the, the local clubs are they're all under about 150 people. Right. When 150 is probably pretty good for many things you want to do. But sure. But uh, right. but, it, it, you know, and then it goes up quite a bit after that to a thousand people and that there's not a lot in between, which is probably the types of events I'm finding that I can kind of get our group involved with, um, you know, like kind of four or 500 people. Like I'm, I really want to four wall and that's that kind of generic term for throwing your own event, um, a new year's Eve gig, but I got to find the right space for it. But, you know, barns and, uh, and, you know, untraditional event spaces. You can fill in, you can bring in the stuff that you need in order to make it cool. And sometimes if you think really out of the box, you can make it really cool. But my big reflection on what you just shared was, uh, a club, um, isn't, is in many places, I think will be a challenge thing that won't equate to family. Yes. Like even, if you think, even if you think of like a great club, like, um, like, if, if there was a hard rock cafe, you know, a place that, you know, has live music and you want to go into them and say, Hey, on a Sunday night, when you're not having live music, I want to do an event here. You know, uh, 
but even that, you know, would you bring, would you bring 12 year olds into the live music area of the hard rock cafe? It, I think it depends on the club. Like I, like I said, you know, the stone church to me is a perfect place to do it because it's got, but it, it definitely is like rock club vibe in there, but it's, it's, it's its own type of rock club vibe. And, yeah. and it, it's a comfortable rock club vibe. It's not seedy. Uh, it's a little worn, uh, but yeah. in, in the right way, you, you know, but like, I'm, I'm thinking of that place uh, and I can't think of the name of it, but I think you do gigs there. I think it's in, in, in your town. Um, I sat in with you there for a couple of songs a couple of years ago. It's a restaurant. I think we actually brought it. Oh our, yeah. Yeah. The our, King's Head. The King's Head. Like that place feels like, and, and I've only been there a couple of times, but, but it feels like maybe that would be a place where you could do something like this too. Yeah. That's, yeah. And that's a, that's a, I, that's a pub, Irish okay. pub. Yeah. And, and you know, that has live music and it is a restaurant. So families do come there and eat. And so, yeah, but the whole point is, is, you know, if your mission is to do something for your family, you know, really think hard about whether the, if you want it to be successful, you know, if you go into a CD club because it's available and it's the only place you can get yeah. and people bring their kids there and they hate it, you know, your event, you know, you probably won't get a chance to do it again if you even get it off the ground the first time. So, right. Um, right. right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, choose wisely and, you know, make decisions that reflect the mission that you're, that you're trying to have. You know, I just, I just did, I know we talked about it last time. I just did a four walled event myself. Well, sort of a four walled event. Um, I did my second Tom Petty night and oh, it was right. one. Th- oh yeah. Yeah. And, um, so I sold tickets in advance. So, so the, the, the net net of that is I have a good relationship with this club owner. Again, the club holds 185 is the fire code. Yep. Um, and it's got some seating, but it's got a big dance floor. You know, it's got like, like, um, that's perfect. Yeah. Bar heights. Um, so I sold tickets in advance on Eventbrite. So that was the, you know, the many different ticketing services. Oh, backing up. So I have this, you know, good, great arrangement with this, um, with this club owner, a venue owner. And, you know, we have, if I, you know, bring X amount of people, especially on an off night, he's happy to, to do a deal with me. That is like, I'll make the money on the booze. You're welcome to have the money on the, on the door. Yeah. And so, that's, you know, and that, that's and what that's we a, do with the church. Yeah, exactly. And Yeah. And you know, again, that deal is probably out there for most people. If you follow through and bring in the, the crowd you want, and especially if it's on an off night, yep. right? Yeah. So, you know, to, to bring 200 people on a Sunday night was a pretty good thing. So, um, I brought in folding chairs to put on the dance floor because this was kind of a more of a concert vibe. Some people walked in. One guy walked in and it was crowded and he didn't want to sit next to somebody he didn't know. And, you know, th- I did not get into the details of doing like like assigned seating Reserved type of thing. Like, seating, yeah. Yeah, I did, it was, I, and I, I was very, very careful on the Eventbrite page to say seating is limited on a first come first serve basis uh, and on the confirmation and on the day before email, you know, I was really clear that I knew this is the one thing that was a little bit different, but, yeah. and, and I, I lost one guy. So two people walked in and walked out and that's fine. You know, you don't, I didn't need that hassle of 20 bucks, you know, right. to, right. But, um, uh, you know, this place, uh, it was an adult event. I charged 10 bucks for tickets. I used Eventbrite. Um, you know, Eventbrite adds a little bit of money for them, their processing fee, but I just added that to the ticket price. So people paid like $11 and 32 cents for a ticket. You know, they would have yeah. paid that to get admission to a club, the special event nature of it, you know, the being all Tom Petty themed stuff and about 20 miles away from here, uh, there was a, another Tom Petty tribute, uh, done in another club by another group of musicians that had like three, 400 people. Um, but again, that was about 20 miles. And I don't think my local crowd who knows me would have gone that extra 20 miles for that. But, um, in my town, so this is, this is what I did. And, you know, we pretty much sold it out. Um, I'd say there's about 170 people there, you know, with the seating, it took out some, it was definitely too crowded at the bar type of thing, but you know, that's where we ended up. And I was, I was, I was, it was pretty rewarding, but it's not hard to do. I mean, the venue, you just have to be willing to push and make it happen. And, and, yeah. and there's a risk involved, right? I mean, there's a potentially a financial risk, uh, depending on whatever, what deal you cut with the club and your musicians. Uh, there's also a potential, um, image risk, right? Where if you put on this big event and you make a big deal out of it and no one comes, well, you know, that doesn't reflect all that well on, on the next yeah. time that you try to do this. So, but chances are you've got a feel for who you can bring and and there's a reason you want to do this and 
you, you know, I, I would say like you, more more bands should just be out there doing this. And I've seen I agree, you know, after we did Fling Fest here, there were uh, especially the first one. But even, you know, as it became a thing and we did it for a year and we did like three or four of them, um, you know, you could see the lights turn on it, it, and other people and their eyes would go wide like, oh, we could do this. And I've seen now other bands doing this. You know, we're not involved with it all. And I think it's great. Uh, it, you know. So let, let me ask you, let me put on my day job hat here, my event producer hat, let yeah. ask you a couple of questions. Do you take out insurance? No, we don't have to because it's at the club. The venue takes the responsibility for that. Correct. Do you do a financial plan? Um, like do you spend money on advertising? We have, yes. And then we just take that off the top. Yeah. It's, I mean, but it's loose. It's kind of in your head. It's in, it, oh, definitely in the head. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe, I mean, there, there might be some emails back and forth, especially as Russ and I kind of talk through things or whatever. But yeah, I mean, it's it's all very loose. Yeah. Do you um, do anything to change the club? Do you bring in any extra seating, extra different lighting or anything like that? We don't bring in extra seating because we don't need to. The club is sort of perfectly set up for what we, what we would need. Uh, we do bring in some lights. Uh, of ours to mix with what they have. And we have, you know, we've set up like a merch table in uh, in the past and things like that. But, but yeah. generally, generally, no, we're not overly changing the club other than, you know, the stuff we bring onto the stage with us. Who takes the tickets? The, the club does. In fact, at both places, both the opera house and the uh, stone church, they both took care of doing that at the door for us which is great awesome and, and in advance yeah actually no the first one i did uh I, for the first one at rochester opera house they their ticket fees were just astronomical and and so they're like look we don't want to do this online and i said that's fine so i just set up a squarespace website with um with a stripe back end to do credit cards and and, and all that to take tickets so yeah cool um do you do they, does the club provide security or do you have security there? Uh, in both cases for us, the clubs provided security. Yeah. So again, that, that's, this is the reason why you do find a venue that has all this infrastructure Correct. already built. It yep. works out well. Totally. If you could find the right one. And actually I think in many places there are the right ones. And like I was saying, the problem I have here is, so this petty thing was awesome, right? I loved it. I love playing it. Um, you know, it was fairly low overhead process for, you know, organizing it. And I think I could do better with it. So it's it's a labor of love, but people loved it. I mean, really had a good time. I'd like to do it for four to five hundred people next year, like on his birthday. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, make it a, an annual thing. And, and I mentioned this last week, but four to five hundred is a weird number. Right. Yeah. You're 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 now renting a venue and yeah. And truly and you don't like, want to do that. It, that's well, I mean, you might when when I was on the road with the clam bake, we did a couple of. Uh, places like that. We played like a lot of, I guess, I guess they found clubs that were in that 500 to thousand person range. And we played a lot of those. They're, they're not, they're not plentiful, but if you're willing to tour, of course you can, you can find them. Uh, but there were a couple of nights where we did sort of four wall, our own event. Uh, I specifically remember asking the question about insurance and being told I never asked that question um, because that didn't happen for the, the <laughs> ones that we did. <laughs> so you were willing to just roll the dice on that, right? Uh, yeah. The, the band leader was, I wasn't, it, it wasn't, a, the band wasn't a partnership. I was just a paid drummer for that right. tour as, as right. all the musicians were. So it was like, yeah, you know what? I don't need to like, never mind. <laughs> we're good. Yeah. Once you go into a venue, you know, there's a bunch of things, you know, uh, you know, the nice thing about going to a club is that they're playing their BMI and ASCAP fees and all these types of things. Once you go into just a blank four walls that you want to turn into a venue, they will almost always require you to have insurance, always. right? Somebody, right. somebody has to have the responsibility and, you know, so, and different levels of services, security, ticket taking, you know, they, they will have different levels of things. But anyway, in my area, um, uh, hard to find that next level size level of venue. You got we like have, Slims, right? You got again, Great, Great American Music Hall. Yeah, Slims, you know, 40, 50 miles away. Oh, right. That's, yeah. You know, <laughs> yes, and, that's right. And um, 
uh, you know, they basically are not in the business of, and, and you know, Slims in particular, you know, they, they want to guarantee like 500 people. Right. Yeah. So, so this is not the right, you know, size thing to that's, that's too much risk. And it's right? too far away. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, you kind of bank on your local following that you've cultivated and those types of things. And again, I think I could do three, 400 maybe, but finding a place. And again, and then New Year's Eve would be the next one that I would want to think about doing. And I think you could do a thousand because people want to go out on New Year's Eve. Yeah. Our band has, you know, enough of a reputation, um, you know, and so, you know, and we've, we've done New Year's Eve and I've seen when we played New Year's Eve for someone else who was selling tickets, how much of those tickets were sold because of us. So I'm pretty confident that we could do a good job on a New Year's Eve thing. But again, I, my approach to that would be New Year's Eve is a unique beast in that it, I believe it has to be connected to a place that has sleeping rooms, you know, Again, you yes. think about your audience and your mission, you know, that's New Year's Eve. And so a venue that's not going to charge you insurance and not going to nickel you dime on the prices, you know, my my plea to a venue will be, listen, I'm going to I can sell 500 hotel rooms for you. You know, I could probably guarantee 300. But, you know, here's our track record. Here's who we are. Here's how many fans we have. You know, come, you know, come learn about our business and, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, but. You know, if you're just doing OK on New Year's Eve now and you'd like to do really well, the the, the guy in our area who really is kind of the gold standard for you know cover music is a guy named Joe Sherino. You know, really nice guy, very good musician. You know, he has operated his business. He has built a life as a cover band, you know, for for over 40 years around here. And um, many, many years ago, he, you know you know, kind of like what you were saying about the clam bake, you have an airline seat a day and you have to find some way to monetize that day in some way. Cause yeah. once that day is gone, you never get that day back and your bills are due on the first of the month every year. Right. So it doesn't matter. So you have, That's right. Exactly. So Joe, you know, is just really smart businessman. And, you know, in addition to getting more than his share you know, many, many, many corporate gigs and weddings and that type of stuff where, where he could, you know, he got a living he made a franchise around New Year's Eve. I mean, his New Year's Eve shows did so well and he got a deal with the hotel. Basically, I'm assuming he, you know, was probably savvy enough where he probably got a commission on a hotel room sold. Sure. He, he probably worked out a very favorable deal for, um, you know, a commission on, on catering sold or anything like that. Maybe not on catering, but but, you know, he certainly was keeping his own ticket fee and probably not paying a dime to rent uh, to rent the room because he had the leverage. He had he a had, fan. Well, that's it. And, and if you can build this concept, uh, you know, over and over again, the first one uh, is in, in my eyes, and of course it could be argued to go exactly the opposite of this, but the first one in my eyes is always the riskiest because you're, you're taking what you think, you know, about what you're doing and applying it there, especially what you think, you know, about being able to attract people to an event like this. Once you do the first one, especially if the people that attended enjoyed it, even if you only broke even, well, now you can build on that. Right. You're like, OK, absolutely. And, and you, but you should treat it like a litmus test. Right. If if you do it and you you know, you needed 300 to break even, you know, 500 to really make your money and you got 110 people in there and you can't very easily and quickly explain why there were you know, why you were 200 or 190 short, yeah. people short. Well, yeah. now don't do that again. Do something different, right? right? Okay. 110 is our number. Great. Let's go somewhere else. Let's shrink down the space, maybe shrink the space to, you know, if you got 110 the first time, shrink the space to a, a 120 room, you know, you're going to have 150 people that want to come the next time. So, you, you know, build more slowly from there. And now it feels like a thing and you're going to turn people away. And that's a good thing. As and that's a, that's a whole up. event marketing thing. So that, yep. that's a whole level of skill we could spend several hours on. Yeah. The point yeah. I was going to actually add was that Joe was so smart um, and his New Year's Eve shows did so well. He added a New Year's Eve Eve show. Oh. Right. So people who didn't want to go out on New yep. Year's Eve didn't want to deal with junk drivers and that type of stuff. So he actually gets two nights of great business out of it. And, um, and, I, and the New Year's Eve Eve one might even actually be bigger than the New Year's Eve one. And I it's totally you know, see a that. night that people go out and celebrate. And so, yeah. you know, yeah, Joe is, you know, again, he. He's loved around here. You know, he's put, he's entertained people. I've shared many times, like the most 
the coolest thing about Joe is that he's like the gold standard for he means something to people around here. He started doing a solo act, acoustic lines around the door in the seventies for people to come and see him. He, he built that into, you know, his band business and, you know, he's, he is, he has provided a good living for himself and his family. And, uh, you know, for many years, all based around cover music and, um, uh, you know, it's really, there's so much to learn from a guy who, you know, he trailblazed a lot of this type of stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, he didn't move to Vegas. I mean, right. you know, there, right. at, at, in the period of time when there was tons of corporate work, um, he definitely rode that wave. And after that, uh, another great lesson from Joe was, um, he doesn't lower his price. His price is his price. And it's a really, it's a very bold thing, right? It's, um, you it's, need uh, some. You need some level of that to succeed. I think in any business, uh, yeah. you've got to have that confidence. And if if you start, and you know, we talk about this on our small business show all the time, but if you start competing on price, you will lose. Uh, Absolutely, you will. You potentially have a short term gain, but it it's you know it's the beginning of the end. Yeah. Well, you know, I and from my side of it, I I always want to keep my band working, right? Right. And it took, took me a long, long time to actually be really comfortable. Um saying no to something, right? Nick and my band has always been, we are worth it. You know, we rehearse our butts off. We put on a great show. We have a product that is unique. We have a service that is very, very unique in the world. And, um, you know, if you demand what you expect from that, and Nick actually kicked me in the butt for this. And, and, you know, I was much more like, yeah, but if what, what, how do we need to be out there? We need to be out there. We We were out there for a long time. And so the, the, the arc of that story is we were out there for a long time my head was a little bit too deep in the sand as to what we had really achieved that it was getting to a point where it was okay to say no. And after you said no for a while, all of a sudden what fills the space of those no's is not nothing, but the work that you're actually expecting yourself to have. Yep. You know, there's a, there's a rule to the universe that, you know, some kind of gravity that, you know, if you, you know, again, you have to be able to deliver the goods and, you know, be good at your craft and that type of thing. But, you know, if you, you know, if you expect yourself to be of a certain value and you, you know, insist on it. And this was the point is, this is the, the lesson that Joe Shirino has taught me is that, you know, it's okay to say no, put yourself into that, into that sphere of bands that demand a certain amount of money and, uh, and you will, you will live there. And you will live there. Yeah. But you have to, you have to put yourself there in, in, I'm not going to say every way, but all the ways that, that matter, which includes. Well, you have to be good. You, you have, have, to, you have to put on trust. a good show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And you have to put on a good image. I And I, I hate to say it, but I think I know that's more important than than putting on the mu- the best show musically. Right. You You just have to show up and look like you're a band that's worth whatever price it is you've decided to charge, even if you're no better than the band that's deciding to charge, you know, 20% of that. Right. Yeah. Uh, so better is, is that magic word because better means so many different things to so many different people. It's a perception thing. Yeah. And a lot of the music that you, you know, especially in this kind of cover genre, a lot of the music is not brain surgery, right? You know, you can, you can yeah. play this stuff and, right. and, uh, uh, right. Um, but you know, someone needs to pay attention to the sound and, you know, you, you yeah. it's, even if it's simple music, there's still a lot of professionalism and, and polish that goes into delivering simple music. And oh, I, that's we've all seen, part of it. We've seen, we've all seen bands that, you know, play Sweet Home Alabama and it might not really be a different performance from the, you know, hundred dollar band to the $10,000 band, but it looks different. It the sound is fuller, right? I mean, you've got lights with one. You've got a band that doesn't look like they just finished mowing their lawn on stage. Yeah. Right. You know, all those things matter, even though if you like isolated just the performance and not say the, the you know, the, the PA from it and all that stuff. It's the same band playing the same song, the same way, the same singer, the same guitar solo. Like, it's just not I, it. It matters how you present yourself. And that's I mean, we've talked about that here. And like you said, it's probably worth that, too, is worth another entire episode or six. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to you know that we we did a, dif, a definition of what is a professional musician, which yeah. is kind of interesting. What is a professional band? You know, what, what is a great question? Yeah. What I is like professional? That. Right. You know. And I, I love that we, you know, we've done this a little bit here. You know, it's, it's not that you have to dress alike. 
unless that's your vibe, unless that's your brand. Right. It's not you have to dress in suits unless that's your brand, you know, but whatever you do, you have to be reasonably consistent to it. What gonna, is your I'm going to put that question on Facebook and we'll see what uh, we'll see what, what everybody says. And, and then we'll we can talk about that on another episode. That's uh, yeah. you get podcast dot com slash Facebook. We'll bring you right to our group. So, yeah, yeah. it's I a like good question. question. Yeah. What's a professional band? Yeah. yeah. All right. Do we have anything else to go through today? We've hit 30 minutes, Paul. Should we go more? I got other stuff I can throw at us. Let's a little bit more. All right. So uh, there was a thing that happened, right? Uh, this is take actually take number three of this particular episode. And it's because one of my compressors here in the setup uh, was acting funky and didn't want to play the theme music properly or wanted to do funny things to the theme music. So I wanted to ask you this question, Paul. I know we all do the things that we have to do sort of reactively, the the changing of, of broken strings, the replacement of drumsticks, right? More picks, more drum heads, those types of things. But yeah. beyond that, we all have a gear that we care about uh, and, and that we rely on. How proactive are you in terms of either maintaining or even replacing that gear before it fails you on a gig? That's an interesting question. So, um, I would say I'm not a and, great and I'm knocking on wood like crazy here because you know, yeah, yeah. You're, you're inducing a lot of bad karma with this question. <laughs> I can tell bad juju, man. It's, it's potentially um, bad juju. Yeah. Um, I would say I'm not good at that. So I'm, I'm not proactive. If nothing's wrong with my gear, I, I don't have it looked at. Right. Yep. I've had, I had a weird year. We played a lot this year and I had some weird problems Somewhere between, well, you know, with a guitar player, electricity coming out of the guitar through myriad of pedals into an amp. Yeah. Uh, I had, you know, I, sometimes I have, I have a lot of guitars and some of them, you know, just wear and tear on the jack and all of a sudden something's wrong at that point of failure. Yep. Um, several pedals and several cables between them. I had some problems there. Um, I assumed it was my amp because of some of the symptoms and, and, you know, I took my amp, uh, and really kind of played with it and I can't make it reproduce any of those things. And so, you know, some of it is the electricity going into the amp. So it's the other you know side of this. So, you know, I would say I'm not proactive about it. I change strings regularly. Sure. Uh, as soon as I, as soon as I get an indication that something's wrong, I have enough gear that I can, you know, send a piece of gear in to get fixed while I use something else, but proactive getting ahead of it, you know, I have extra strings, extra picks, and extra guitars at a gig. Well, that, I don't see, have an extra amp. Yeah, but, that's the but question. Yeah. I don't have an extra amp, but um, I do have one of those um, modeling pedals that can go straight into a PA. And I should I really should keep that in our truck. I had mm. you know, knock on wood, I've never had an amp totally fail on me. But um, uh, rather than carry a whole extra amp, I think what I would do is, you know, I have like this Vox, um, wow. you know, it has models amps and, and cabinets and, and a bunch of pedals and that type of stuff and you know you can just go right into a pa for that and you know as a as a fail safe as a that. fail safe yeah for sure yeah I, and that's i mean i so i think i think you probably it sounds like you do enough of it such that you feel comfortable walking into a gig knowing that uh if anything fails it's either something that's not critical to make it to the end of the gig or you've got a backup of whatever those critical things are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, I'm, plan. I'm yeah, you've got a plan, right? <laughs> yeah. And I'm kind of the same way. I, um, I, you know, I show up with extra symbols. Um, I always show up with an extra snare drum because that's one of those things that if it, if, if a snare drum starts to fall apart, there's a lot of moving parts on a snare drum. You're hitting it a lot. And it sees a lot of, of wear and tear and it can, you know, just that, that impact can start to loosen all the screws around the edge and, you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, it's way too time consuming to even begin to think about taking one apart, uh, you know, on a gig or whatever. If a Tom fails on me, well, okay. I've, you, you know, I've got at least one more, if not two. Uh, if not three, depending on the gig, like I can just skip one, you know, uh, uh -huh. the, the bass drum is the other one that's sort of a big deal for me. And I don't carry two bass drums to a gig anymore. I used to, when I was a kid, but that was just because I played two bass drums at a time. Uh, 
But there's two things that really that can go wrong with the bass drum. Number one is you break the head. And I did that on a gig, actually on a clam bake gig. We were in the middle of nowhere. We were in normal, sorry for anybody that lives there, uh, normal Illinois or <laughs> Dubuque, Iowa. I think they're right on, on either side of a border from each other. And, and the problem was I had brought all kinds of extra heads, including a bass drum head, uh, but it was on the bus. And this was the one week stretch of this three month tour that we didn't take the bus. We had a, just a van. So we were on sort of skeleton gear and skeleton crew. And, uh, and so I didn't like, I went through this, this head, you know, during the second set of a gig and we had like another gig the next night. And I think it was a Saturday. So, you know, is this, if we're going to be able to find a store tomorrow. And so I looked in my bag of gear on a set break and I found, I had, they, they sell these little Kevlar patches for bass drums that are built I think they, they were originally built for metal drummers. You put them right where the, the pad impacts and it makes like a, a clickier sound to get that sort of high end click that, that you get that you want when you're doing like really fast stuff with, with metal. And I don't know why, but I had a, a few of those in, in kind of my stick bag. And so I put one of those on and that saved me actually through that gig and the next night, it was totally fine. It patched the drum. So I always keep one of those with me and I always travel with a spare bass drum pedal. Because, yep. because that I've had one of those fall apart on a gig and that is a disaster. Uh, are there drum, uh, I mean, we'll be cautious here, but are there yeah. drums and drum hardware that uh, have the reputation of not being able to stand up to the rigors of, of uh, more than a hobbyist drummer? Um, more than a, more than a, a, a bedroom drummer. Yeah. A set that never moves versus a set that, that needs to be like, you know, broken down and, and set up again. Um, I don't think there's, I don't think there's any one brand that I would single out as being better or worse at this, but every brand sort of has their, has a full line of, of quality and reliability. And so you could find, you know, Pearl and Yamaha stuff that's at the bottom of that end and the top of the, that end. Right. And, and so when I'm buying a new, like hi hat stands are the things that I am, aggressively proactive about every few years. I just buy a new hi-hat stand. Mm. Well, because again, there's a lot of moving parts. You, you're going to basically, you know, tear the whole thing down. I mean, it collapses down is really the right way to say it. And there's, you know, you're, there's a lot of things that can just wear out on it. So I just stay ahead of it and replace it, you know, every maybe three or four years. It's not, um, it's not something that I need to do every six months or something, but I don't want to have that fall apart at a gig um, because I don't want to carry a second one because they're kind of big. Uh, so, and I could, I could deal with a gig without a hi hat. It would be non optimal, mm. but, um, but no, when I'm buying hardware, I'm very aware of, okay, you know, what's this look like? Is it going to be something that's a easy to set up and break down, but also is it going to hold its position on stage or is it going to be wobbly or is it going to fall apart? And, uh, and I've had, you know, throughout my playing career, uh, I've had all ranges of quality. In fact, as I'm looking here in the studio, I've got some stands here, symbol stands here in the studio that I would never bring to a gig because, yeah. because they're not, they're not in my eyes, they're not meant for that. I also have mic right. stands that I wouldn't bring to a gig because, you know, right. you can set them up and get it set up and it's great. But as soon as you start unscrewing it and rescrewing it over and over again, that's where these things for me anyway, totally break down and, and become unreliable. So you have to get stuff that's just built to be constantly, you know, morphed. So I, I got to laugh as we're having this conversation, yeah. I'm thinking about the greatest thing that I have in my arsenal of keeping uh, our band uh, avoiding disaster is our sound guy, Bill. He is freaking MacGyver. The yeah. amount of stuff that is broken in the regular, <laughs> you know, travails of, of, uh, of doing a gig that he has somehow jury rigged to get us through a gig. Joe's snare broke like the, you know, the, the, yeah. Was called a trap. The part, the underneath part of it. You know, oh, the, the snare part. Yeah, yeah. The snare part of it. Yeah. It just broke, and he MacGyvered together some way to hook that thing together that got us through the gig. It was absolutely unbelievable. He's just, you know, really. He's just very mechanical with his hands. Yeah, and you know, having a guy like that around is unbelievably valuable. You I need, mean, you need that in your band. At some point, you will need that. I, I totally. Did you agree. have that? Did you have that in uh, in your touring band? Uh, you have some guy. In the clam bake, it was actually me and 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 Billy Constant. Yeah, you're that way. You're definitely that way. I definitely, yeah. But I had a I had a I had a, a partner in crime, Billy Constable, rest in peace, man. Uh, 
our banjo player was was the same way. And we loved when we had to, you know, like it wasn't good if it hap- had to happen in the middle of a gig because we, we had other jobs to do. But um, but there were many times where we would be like, all right, get the soldering iron. Let's rip apart that speaker. Let's fix this thing. You know, it was flaky yep. last night or whatever. But of course, we had, you know, uh, uh, basically unlimited time. The only thing we were doing was was either driving around or playing gigs. So, it, you know, my big skill in this area is being able to find a bar within five miles of any gig that we do. That's really how I contribute to the overall <laughs> health of the band. <laughs> hey, everybody's got their their their, hey, their uh, strengths. You, we all got to contribute, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you need a MacGyver for sure. Definitely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I think I need to be proactive about this compressor, but I, I'm not going to be, I'm just going to say that out loud. Uh, it's going to fail someday and I'm just going to have to wire around it for one show. And then I'll, if that's the point that I'll Amazon up a new one. Boom. So, yeah. I, cause I, it's not worth it. It's, I mean, it's been like this for years. My problem was I was away and I turned it off and that it takes many days for it to get back to the point where it's reliable again. Not weird. It is weird because it's totally solid state, man. Like it should. It's not be like it has to warm up. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> but it's weird. Like I'll send. You heard it before. I'll send sound into it, and you get like very little sound, and then it crackles a little, and then it opens up. Like it had to have the dust blown out of it or something. That's, there's got to yep. be a bad capacitor in there or something like that. But I'm hey, it. so before we go, yeah. I just want to kind of share this last little thought about this petty thing because we talk a lot yeah. about. You know, songs that you can do anything to and they'll still go over stuff like that. But the guys who I put together, because this this was not a House Rockers gig, it was, you know, Paul, Kent and Friends. And so there were two guys from the House Rockers, two other guys, um, Joe, my drummer, sat in on a couple. But I just want to say that, you know, that you can do anything to a lot of those songs. But um, when you bring out the nuance that made those songs great, they really watch what happens to people. So I'm going to say both Nick and Simon. So Nick focused on the, the nuance of the keyboard parts in the, in the Tom Petty song. And Simon was freaking unbelievable. I don't know how he found the time, but he did many of the solos note for note. Wow. He, he, he really spent a lot of time to get the tone, right? He played slide where there was slide. I mean, it was, you know, I, I won't say it was a tribute show, you know, in that we were going for everything note for note. Sure. But the point of this all is, you know, we played, you know, we played Don't Come Around Here No More. We played uh, You Got Lucky. You know, those are like, those are very unique sounding songs. We played a lot of the straight up rockers, but even with the straight up rockers, we didn't just turn up the distortion and just, you know, and grunge it away. You know, there was that kind of chime. Uh, I played 12 string guitar in some of these things. And, you know, that, you know, and what I noticed is, is that it, it, it really made people's eyes light up, you know, that it's that sound. And by light up I actually meant that they would close their eyes and let this kind of songs kind of wash over them. And it was an amazing thing. So I, it was so rewarding to kind of, and I didn't know, cause we, you know, we actually rehearsed the only time we rehearsed this, uh, the gig was at seven, uh, doors were at seven. We rehearsed from three thirty to six thirty. Oh. Was our one run through of this thing. So we played. Yeah, we played about six hours that day. Just and like I'm All-Star hearing man style, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and um, I was just hearing what the guys brought to it. And you know, Tom Duell, my friend who played bass on this, you know, he did a wonderful job. The harmonies were right. You play with good guys who you know know how to listen to something. And again, yes. cover genre is a thing, right? You know, it gets a lot of disparaging. Uh, you know, remarks about, about cover music cause it's not original and you know, all you're doing is copying something, but most people don't even copy when they copy, they just get close. And, yeah. um, and, uh, when you take the time to go in for the sounds and the actual parts, you know, it, it really can do something really remarkable to the listener. I mean, it, you don't know what part of a song that people love. I mean, you know, you know, everybody sings the chorus, you know, that part of it, yep. but reason those songs became magic is because of every element of it. You know, every, every thought that was put into every sound that you hear. Um, and so, you know, the difference between jangle and, and distortion is a significant thing to understand, you know, solos that play in certain spaces and lay out in certain spaces. That's a significant thing to understand. Drum grooves are like, you cannot play, breakdown unless you play that drum drum groove it's not the same song it's oh that that song in particular is there is one drum part correct 
So I, I just want to say it was, I want to, you know, I know some of my bandmates for this, listening to this, it was really wonderful to hear them go and, and they did it. I mean, I, they did it for me, but I think they did it out of respect for the music that, you know, they knew that there were a bunch of Tom Fetty fans who were going to be in the audience and they wanted to bring the right thing. It was not like, Hey, let's get together and jam some Tom Petty songs sure. or let's do our own interpretation, whatever that might be of some Tom Petty songs. They listened. And as, like I said, everything was not note for note. It was not tribute, but the right things were note for note and it made the world a difference. It was really cool. You know, my buddy, Ron Marks, uh, who I met down in Austin, he lives in Nashville now. And when I met him, he was a full time cover band musician. He played in a band called dysfunction junction and, uh, at the time down in Austin, they played, you know, three nights a week pretty consistently. And, and that's where he made his living. And uh, and I remember hanging out with him once and just talking about it. he's like, oh, I got to learn, you know, 30 songs for some gig or whatever uh, that he was filling in for somebody. And uh, and he's like, I'm like, wow, that you know, you, that's that's a lot to cram in. He's like, no, it's not a big deal. I just listen to the tune and I listen for the things that people know. And those are the things I focus on and learn note for note and get the mm. tone right and all of that stuff. And he's like, the rest, I just need to know the chords and I can make it through the song. Uh, he's like, but, you know, you just listen to a tune. He's like, you can know. And of course, you you can if you've been doing it long enough and you, you learn to identify what those things are. Uh, and it wasn't like he was playing songs that he'd never heard before. These were all relatively popular tunes, like you said. And uh, so, you, you know, you listen, you're like, oh, yeah, there's that. That groove's got to be exactly right. Or that little lick has to be exactly right. Or or that sound of that, that, you know, guitar on the, the opening of the chorus or whatever. Yep. That's got to be there. Otherwise, it doesn't sound like the song. But the rest of it, you know, you just play the chords and, and make sure you're in the structure and you're fine. And uh, so he really, you know, he had he had sort of distilled it down to a science. And there, And I've taken a lot of that with me. You know, when I'm like when I'm doing these madhouse gigs, it's like, yeah, I got to do the same thing. I don't have time to like learn every nuance of, you know, two and a half hours worth of music in a day. It's like, nope, let me listen through. Oh, there's that. That's something that's important, you know, and usually what's the thing that your friend remember you had your your friend who um, sang for Van Halen for one tour. Yeah. What was his what was his line about about memorizing lyrics? He said, well, he he would do his best to memorize them, uh, but he had a, a prompter on stage. This was Gary Sharon. And he said, uh, you know, I asked him to use the prompter. He's like, well, I mean, I know all these lyrics, man. You know, I grew up with them, but he's like, anything can distract you in any moment. And he and he said, it's possible, you know, when you're in front of 15,000 people, but it doesn't matter. You could be in front of 15 that any line that you're about to sing is the most important line to that, that. guy over there. I love that. Yep. Yeah. And so you don't want to screw it up. Uh, even if it's just like the third line of a verse, you know, it might seem like a throwaway, uh, but it's not. I remember I, we did no matter what at, uh, you know, the bad finger tune at uh, uh -huh. Macworld all-star gig. And it was the first time I'd sang it. And that song's weird. It's got like it, a lot of the lyrics seem the same. So they're, they're a very interchangeable. Uh, and I screwed. I, you know, I didn't. I mean, I did. I screwed it up, but I didn't know. I was just like, oh, let me sing something. It doesn't matter. You know, I'll sing the right note. It'll be fine. And Andrew Shallot came to me the next day and he's like, you know, you screwed up my favorite song last night. <laughs> I'm like, what? There like, you no go. matter what. I'm like, I thought we played that great. He's like, well, you had the lyrics wrong in this part and this part. I'm like, oh, crap. OK. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It hey, matters. the reason you you chose it to play is because it's a song that got to that level of meeting, right? Correct. And, and, it, and that's the key right there is don't forget that these songs, uh, I, they either have meaning because they're popular or they're popular because they have meaning. It doesn't matter. They have meaning. It's true. You gotta, you, I think you have to respect the song. You know, you have to not, if you approach cover music as, Oh, here's a chord chart. <laughs> you know, I think you're doing a disservice to the music and, yep. you know, doing a disservice to something that has made its way through the millions of songs and, you know, elevated itself to a place that it means something to somebody. Who are you as the cover musician? I mean, if, if you're going to try and put a different spin on it, yeah. that you're, you're taking a creative approach to it. That's, that's one thing. But if you literally half assed it for the sake of half assing it, that's not cool. Right. That's right. Yeah. You've got to, you've got to really know what parts of a song you can half ass. It's true. I, well, and 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 that so I would I would put it the glass half full. You have to really know what songs are the what parts of the song you have to pay specific 
respect to. I, I, I would half yeah, ass you no no one can half ass anything ever, right? Well but you know, what are the things what are the things that require, demand, deserve the additional time? They yeah, that's right. And and the but the trick is knowing that. And I've been in bands with people where, you know, and I have to be very careful because I know I'm like probably overly thoughtful about going in and making sure I'm learning the right parts. I don't always get it right. And I'm upset when I, when I realize, especially in the middle of a gig, Oh crap. Like this is the part of the song I should have paid attention to. Now I know, you know, I don't always get it right, but, but I am very aware of that. And sometimes just very casually I'll say, Oh yeah, I just hacked my way through this. And then I find like, you know, three weeks later that, you know, somebody else in the band sort of took that as, I don't want to say permission, but they, they, they followed my lead, but not my entire lead. Cause we didn't really have a conversation like this about it. And they're like, Oh yeah, I'm just hacking my way through it. Like you and like, well, yeah, but there's parts I don't hack my way through and there's parts you're not supposed to hack your way through either. <laughs> and it's up to you to figure out which those parts are. <laughs> uh, and I've found that and it's like, Oh crap. Now, how do I, you know, I've, I've unintentionally led this person here. Now I need to tell them I led you wrong, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, um, a couple of things next, next time we get together. Um, I think we should both prepare our, our Thanksgiving show, what we're thankful for this year for playing some music. So I'll, I'll challenge you to come up with five and I'll come up with five and we'll, we'll combine them for a top 10. All right. All right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And sure. then, uh, I was in New York last week and I got to see Springsteen on Broadway, which is pretty awesome. So I can share a couple of stories about that. Cool. And then last thing I want to share today is remember we had my buddies, the Coffus brothers um, on you know a year ago or something, maybe a little bit more than that. And they just came out with a new record roll with it. I think it's awesome. I think people really enjoy it. So uh, we're going to give them a little bit of plug and, you know, hopefully they'll get some, some new ears listening to their great music around oh, the country, nice. around the world. I like that. Cool. Yep. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, that brings us to the end, I believe. So it's time to see if the compressor works. Look at that. See? (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Come visit us, gigabpodcast.com. Add a slash Facebook to that if you want to join our uh, our little group. Always be performing. Always. Always. Always.